show. <laughs> yeah, it gives me, that I, I honestly, well, actually during COVID, I should point this out, when we were all locked down and we couldn't go anywhere, we, we went online, didn't we, yeah? So, so I don't know if those of you, anybody was on that meeting when we very kindly had Marilyn and, and Neville on, online with us. Wendy was there, wasn't it? I don't remember you saying. I think it was, I think that was the last time I saw you, mate. Yes. It was that terrible. You never come back again. <laughs> but no, it was it was fantastic. I got Neville and Marilyn to come on a, on a Zoom meeting, and there was, I think, about 65 or 70 people. It was in, in the beginning of lockdown. Uh, and it, it really lifted everybody. It really did. It was a, it was a great night. Um, and thanks for that very much. You know, I know it's taken your time free of charge, and I think it's fantastic. And now, you know what I mean, I've managed to get them to dry in three and three quarter hours. It's a long way. It's a long way, right? And they're giving their time because they've got so much experience. They don't, they don't need to necessarily work anymore. They're here to help you guys, really, yeah? And to help charities. Yeah, that's what it's about tonight. It's all about charities. And it's wonderful that they're taking the time to do this. I really appreciate it. If you give an even bigger round of applause than the Queen, <laughs> but never right to come up and step up to you. speak up. All right. Um, thanks very much for that introduction, Lee. Um, it's, it, was, uh, it was really nice of you to uh, invite me and um, invite me. It was uh, because Marilyn <laughs> won't be speaking. <laughs> yeah, she's, got, um, she's got her head full of other stuff and uh, she's behind the uh, scenes kind of person. So don't expect uh, so don't expect that. Um, so uh, yeah, thanks very much. And, and a couple of years ago, we met over Zoom. And then this time, he said, "Will you come down?" And uh, and I thought, I'll I'll see what this chap's all about. Well, I thought he's got a good hairstyle. Ne nearly, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I've got nearly as much hair, but not not quite. And and he's into property. And I thought, well, yeah, we're a good match. And I looked on his LinkedIn. And he said, for three years, he uh, worked for Cunard. And I thought, wow, what a coincidence. Uh, but that's where the coincidence stopped because uh, he only worked uh, three years. I've uh, worked fucking hard for 58 years. So, uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, I'll, um, I'll start with uh, this, this picture of Mum and Dad, 1937, and it'll, be, it'll become relevant to my background. And they got married in 1937, and they wanted everything that everybody else wants. Is, is, that, is that going, by the way, Lee? Yes. Is it all right? Sorry, you'll change your voice. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, so they wanted everything what we all want. You know, we want peace, and we want happiness, and. Uh, and uh, if you if you get a partner, if you're lucky enough to get a partner, then you want a roof over your head and a, a steady income and you know a car and what have you. So they had all those ambitions they did, but they got stopped in their tracks because uh, none of that happened for them because my dad got called up to go to Burma and uh, he was in the killing fields of Burma for years and years. And uh, when he came back, he was uh, uh, a different man. Um, but I didn't know him before that, obviously. So, so my sister was born in, um, um, I don't know, 46, my brother in 48, and then they had me in 1950. And they all said, um, after having me, they decided to shut the door on having children. And, and I always thought it's because I was so good 
and they would never find another one as good as me. But then I learned later on that they both said, no, um, that wasn't right. You was just a little sod, and that's why we didn't want any more. So, but there we are. Uh, it's a clue there. I was on the beach at Mablethorpe, but I was filling my buckets with sand, and I did become an ambidextrous builder. So, um, they, when I was five years old, they sent me to an institution uh, because I was such a good child. They sent me to this institution, and you'll never find a picture of me because I was hardly ever there. And um, I mean, they, they did teach me a lot. So a lot of people like to call it school. And from the first day to the last day, about 10 years, uh, it was uh, hell for me. And I hated every second. And I could tell you, like, uh, before I left, uh, a, a good year before I left, I could tell you exactly um, how many hours I got left of school. <coughs> so uh, the problem was, this is what I see. Words moving about, letters moving about. That's, that's what my eyes see. And I couldn't explain. And dyslexia wasn't known in those days. In the 1955, it wasn't known. But I could, and I just said, um, I can't see. So what do they do? Send me to the doctor, got me a pair of glasses. Now the letters were bigger, but I still couldn't see and I still couldn't explain. So they, I was a bit disruptive in the things I did because I said, I don't know, I, I don't know, you know, um, uh, what you're on about. And um, and so they called me stupid, which they all kid, they all call kids like me stupid. Um, and then. Uh, to top it all, then they have called me specky eyes and poor eyes and spastic. So that's what I was called over the 10 years um, because I was only kid in the class with glasses. And once a teacher uh, starts on you, it gives a green light for the other 30 kids in the class to copy the teacher. So it was a shit time. So here we are, 1965, this is my mum, my poor suffering mum who who that day and every day she used to say to me when I was um, disruptive, she, should, she used to say to me, I should have killed you at birth boy. <laughs> and she didn't mean it, but she told me every day, didn't she, Marion? She said, I should have killed him at birth. <laughs> so, so I was, um, I was free, I was happy, but I was brainwashed because I didn't know that I could make a living uh, on my own. So I went into the traditional job, which I didn't want to go into, and I, and I ran away every time, every, every time uh, somebody realised I couldn't uh, read or write, they called me stupid and I'd run. And sometimes I'd run before they called me stupid. So you, in those days, in the 60s, you could uh, get a job in the morning, be fired in the afternoon, and get another job in the evening. So it was so easy to get a job, um, and I was pretty good. I, I, I could have gone into a job where I could have hit, but it wouldn't have fulfilled me at all. I, ha I was pretty good at organising, but with organisation means diaries and means timesheets and stuff that I couldn't do. So I ran. Now, what does every 15 or so, 16 then, 16... Uh, years and seven days. So what does a 16 year old boy want? 16 year old girl. So anyway, this girl, I can remember her name now, um, her name was Marilyn Todd. She, um, she loved me and I loved her and, um, and she was the first person that didn't think I was stupid. So that, that was uh, great. Anyway, after six weeks we decided we would uh, live the rest of our lives together. So one night, oh, and we got, I got banned from her, seeing her because I'd seen her for six weeks every single day and her father banned me. So it was only a Monday, Wednesday and a Friday that I could actually see her, but little did he know I saw her every day. And, um, and, and she was passing my house uh, one night from going to, uh, from going to the hairdressers to going home and uh, so, uh, we stood outside my father's house uh, and it was 1966, July 1966 and uh, we said we were going to get married 
have a family and buy a house. And um, I remember that day, well, that was uh, 56 years ago, and I've never seen her since. <laughs> but I, that's why I said, don't introduce Marilyn, because I've got a joke. <laughs> yeah, anyway, 52 years married, and, um, and, got, and, and in those days, boys called girls birds, and that bird could have flown away a million times. Oh, my voice is breaking out. A million times she could have flown away, but she didn't. Yeah. So anyway, our first goal was um, sorted, 68, two years later. We didn't want this house because it had gas lamps in, didn't have any water, no electric, and there was a toilet outside. We didn't want it, but we wanted a new one, like all young couples, and it's, uh, new ones were £3,000 in those days, and uh, we, went, we went to the door and said, oh, we'll have this nice uh, chalet bungalow. And he said, go and see the mortgage broker. And the mortgage broker said, you ain't got a fucking chance. And because I didn't earn enough and he didn't take the girls' wages into consideration in those days. So instead of going for a cheaper one, cheaper, we went to the bottom of the pile. We went to uh, every house that had been on the market for years and couldn't, couldn't be sold. So we, we chose that one, 650. I could have got a 450 pound house in those days, but the problem was, that was in a village near Peterborough, but the problem was it had got air conditioning. And we didn't want air conditioning, not the type it was selling. In other words, it hadn't got a bloody roof. So that had gone too far, but this had got a shell and we could do something with it. So two years later, I renovated it uh, with the help of my father, or my father renovated it with the help of me. That's more like it. So we uh, got married, and uh, that, was, that was the second goal. <coughs> must have been the second goal, yeah, and moved in. And uh, nine months and 19 days later, our third goal happened. Yeah, so our first baby, uh, Elaine. So. Now there was a fourth goal that I didn't mention, and the fourth goal was, uh, we thought those three goals were okay, and the fourth goal was to work together, but that seemed an impossible goal, it did, but in, um, we got that goal in, in a few years' time. So here we are, we've, we renovated this house, uh, we sold it, 1971, we went for, we sold that for 2,100, and that semi-detached house was 2,000. And again, it was, there was no plumbing in it and an outside toilet and stuff like that. So we renovated that, and I did a lot of work on that, and Marilyn did as well. And, um, and in that time, nine months, that property went up from 2,000 to 6,500 pounds. So we was on, really on the property ladder then. Um, Marilyn wanted to, uh, well we'd moved from here to here because we wanted a garage and an extra bedroom and a garden in the front. We moved from there to there because we wanted a bungalow and a new one, fairly new one. That was seven and a half thousand, but it was in the middle of fields. I was working 12 hours a day. Uh, Marilyn got the baby, couldn't drive and hated it. So we thought we'd move back into town and I bought Alexander Road, seven and a half thousand in an auction. And I didn't know what I had to do because when the hammer fell, they asked me for the money and I, and I hadn't got any. <laughs> so the next day, Marilyn went down to Barclays and said, could I have seven and a half thousand because we just bought a house in an auction? And the managers in those days made the decisions. And he said, what is your um, bank number? Yeah, well, and she says, oh, I haven't got one. I haven't got a bank account. And he says, well, why have you come here then? If you she says, because I can't drive and you're the nearest bank to where, um, where my father-in-law lives, because I dropped her off. And she came out with seven and a half thousand pounds. <laughs> Little did we know that it was a bridging loan. We thought it was a mortgage. So we had this bridging loan and we didn't know. Uh, after a couple of months, we got a letter to say, you haven't paid your bridging loan off, so if you haven't sold your house, we're going to take in a couple of months. We're going to take the two houses and auction them off. But by the skin of skin of our teeth, we we sold that just in time for about ten ten and a half thousand. But in the meantime, I thought I was a builder. 
and I was working for somebody else. Uh, um, I was working for the Ministry of Defence at the time, and I thought I was a builder in the evenings and weekends. So I took the windows out. But we've got another house, you see. We didn't need we didn't need to live in there because we've got two houses. I didn't know bridging like this there, but but we took the windows out. We took the plumbing out. We took the uh, we were going to rewire it. We took all the chimney stacks out and took half the roof off, and then we sold it. And then go shit, we've got to move. We couldn't move into that house. There was a recession on. Um, I had the house valued. We paid seven and a half thousand. I got three and a half thousand mortgage. I. I had it valued at one and a half thousand pounds. I'd ruined it. It was a building prop that needed the building knocking down, really. So we were stuck. Negative equity, I think they call it nowadays. So uh, we got a caravan and we um, and, and we lived in the caravan. There's uh, Marilyn and, my, and uh, Elaine. And that was, that was it, that was our life. Life, it was, it was shit, it was. People used to say in the winter, how are you getting on Nev, in that caravan? And I used to say, well, it's not too bad, it's got running water. And they go, oh, did you plumb it in yourself? No, it's a fucking condensation, running down the walls every morning. So it was bad. I worked 12 hours a day, Marilyn cried 12 hours a day, being in that shithole. So, um, so, but I wanted to be with her. That was our goal. Not only to get a house and have a baby and, uh, uh, and uh, whatever the other goal was. Um, it was, we wanted to be together. That was the whole idea, and work together. So, first thing was, uh, I'd got it in my mind, I hated my job. And whatever you manifest in your mind will happen. And, I manif and we couldn't get any lower than that. But I got a sack. And now we was in the caravan. I got no money coming in. So uh, you know, be very careful what you wish for in life. So uh, there we was. We fell into the uh, trap of, um, is it the doll or the uh, assistance, welfare. We fell into the welfare trap. And we was desperate. My mum used to bring food around, and we wanted. I needed another two pounds a week to feed the family. And they said the dole office said the only way you get another two pound a week is having a baby. And I go, this is why I want two pound to feed the baby. I can't have another one, can I? Because I can't afford to feed the one I've got. No, but that's all, that's the only way to get any more money is to have another baby. So I had an altercation. And um, on the 26th of September, uh, 1974, I had this altercation. And, and Edda, I always wondered, <coughs> when I was queuing up for the three months, why the um, Dole Office counter was high. <laughs> and why it was wide. Because if I could have got my hands around his neck, then I would have been. Anyway, I said to him, you can't look after me. My bosses couldn't look after, well, my bosses couldn't look after me, so uh, I will look after myself. And um, in the Dole office, every week, I used to stand there in line, well, right near here, next, next, you know, and go. And I used to pray to my God to give me a job, to give me another chance. And my God was telling me, you've had 17 bloody chances, it's time to stand on your own feet yourself. So, uh, so I burnt the bridges, told them they could stick the doll money, and I cried all the way home on my bike, thinking I'd let Marilyn down. And then, but I can compose myself, and Marilyn says, hey, did you get on, did you get two pounds? And I go, we can do whatever we like. We're free now in our lives to do whatever we want to do. So, what does anybody want to do? Look through the yellow pages, copy what somebody else is doing, but there was only two problems with the yellow pages. Every job that was in there that you could do, every business you could think about, um, there was two problems. One, you needed money, and two, you needed skills. One, we hadn't got any money, not even the money for that week, because I burned the bridges with that dog people, but two, I got no skills. Or I thought I'd got no skills, but in all the jobs I'd had, I 
got some skills, but I didn't realise, I wasn't confident. But then there was, a, there, there was um, an extension going up opposite our house, and there was a lorry turned up, and it said, um, I said, look, it's full of glass. They're putting new windows in. Some twat has got to clean that glass, and then it dawned on me. I knew a twat. And, and so we went down, we went down to uh, Pridmore's in a haberdashery shop, and, um, and we bought a 37 piece pence piece of scrim for cleaning windows in business. I went to my father's house, I said, Dad, can I borrow your ladder? And he said, yes. So we was in business. So for the next year, I was cleaning windows, cleaning gutters, cleaning drains, cleaning anything. Um, and this was, I was in the property maintenance business. Now up to 1974, I was right, <coughs> and the whole bloody world was wrong. Anything happened, it was their fault. It was, the per it was my boss's fault, it was my friend's fault. It was, the, it was everybody's fault except mine. And then over that year, I realized that um, God had given me two ears and one mouth and I should use them in that capacity. But of course now, they, uh, I use them in a different capacity, don't I? So, so anyway, I started listening <coughs> to people. And I, the first time in my life I started listening to my dad. My dad wasn't afraid of anything except going self-employed because he was dyslexic. But he used to say to me from about four years old to 15 or so, I should have, I should have, I should have gone self-employed because it was a skilled carpenter and cabinet maker. And he'd point out this shop and he'd say, Mr. Dobson wanted me to go in to be a partner with him. And I should have done. But mortgage, kids, blah, blah, blah. And I didn't. But he used to say, when I was a kid, he used to say, just do it, do it. Don't be afraid, just do it, whatever it was. But I, was, I said to myself, I would never say I should have in my life again. And that made me uh, stop procrastinating, make decisions. So that's a, a good thing. Albert Johnson, I'd learned painting and decorating with him. Uh, you know, I didn't realize that I was really, I got a skill, um, but I, I learned it from him. And I won't say he was a tyrant, he was meticulous. But, and, and he taught me to do the job properly. And, um, and after sending me back to, you know, and me being late home uh, from work, yeah, I got the idea that I should do it properly. Cyril Short, I, I, um, I met him in 1977. Uh, I still talk to him regularly now. He's 96 and um, he's a great mentor of mine. Um, Arthur, down the bottom, Arthur died. Um, he was, uh, he's got a fish and chip shop and he'd had a lot of different businesses and he wasn't afraid of anything. And I remember at 13, he, we was talking about his brand new car that he'd got and um, how did he get it? And he said to me at the age of 13, speculate to accumulate. I hadn't got a clue what he was talking about and I hadn't got the confidence to <coughs> ask him. I couldn't say, Arthur, what are you talking about? Because I was 13. And, uh, and I'd only asked him how he could afford the car because I'd heard my mum and dad say that the night before. So it wasn't me that was speaking, it was through my mum and dad. And when he said Neville, he looked at my mum and dad. He said, Neville, me, because he knew where it came from, he said, Neville, you have to speculate in life to accumulate if you want anything. But he was talking to my mum and dad. And, and it took me to 10. They had a wage packet from the age of 10, and the, the money they earned, they could do anything with. And um, what a Sorry, great incentive. So, so this, well, uh, Embrace the Unexpected, we was looking for a warehouse, and there was Abbott, because we needed the space, uh, more more stock in the, in the shop, because we were turning out so fast. <coughs> this was a co-op supermarket, but they had advertised it like a barn in the middle of a field, in a, a village. So that's what we thought we was coming up to. And we came up to that, we saw the estate agent outside, and across the road there was a school, and there was all hundreds of kids coming out. And we had got no intention of expanding at all, just getting a warehouse. And um, 
And we said, this is not a warehouse, this is our next shop. And we said to the agent, why did you advertise it like you did? And he said, because we didn't want the staff inside to know that the place was for sale because they'll be made redundant. And um, so it was, it was good for us, sorry, we bought it there and then. Uh, by 1984, uh, we had been buying and selling, buying and selling. Every week, virtually every day, we would buy and sell. We'd flip property. We was into some commercial property, so it was terrace houses. It was, uh, there were full renovations. Some were just flipping. All types of property. And it was like full on. And then we built those. We built two houses and six shops because they had a piece of land. And uh, that was the first lot that we've kept. So now we're in 10 years we've been in business and they were the first one we've, ones we've kept. And we've still got them and they, they've produced 600,000 in rent they have and they've gone up from the original 72,000 it cost to build all of it. So here we are. Uh, Elaine was 13. She uh, got one of her mates, um, Rachel, to leave school and to set the third kidney care up. So they put all the racking in, they put the stock in, they started trading, and then the school found out they wasn't attending school. So they had to go back to school and we had to put somebody else in the shop. But within a couple of weeks, there was a, a summer holiday and then uh, Elaine um, worked with us in the, for the six weeks in the summer holiday and then Marilyn said, we'll go and get some new clothes for you because you've grown it. And she said, no, no, I'm not going back there. Why are you not going back there? Well, they're just a load of kids. And that's what she said at 13. So we decided to homeschool her or office school her, however you call it. And nobody said anything. So she left at 13. 86, millionaires at last. Now, I always thought a millionaire would be sitting at his table counting his money. <laughs> you know, loads of cash. But we were millionaires. There was millionaires, but we hadn't got any money. We've got assets, we've got stock, but we even counted the uh, diesel in the tanks of the uh, builders' lorries. We even looked at the change in our pocket, and it was what a time though, you know, we scraped it together and really our assets were um, a million pound. Absolutely fantastic. Look at the haircut. I used to have a perm in those days. But I mean, it was all the rage it was. Yeah. <laughs> so um, having, um, my mum and dad wanted us to have some photos because they were so proud of us. We've got this fantastic house and, um, but I didn't feel really good in dressing up, you know, throw a photo, but it's a bit embarrassing. But my mum and dad loved it. And they loved going in their Bentley and they loved, they loved everything. But we seem to have had the Midas touch then because um, everything we touched <coughs> seemed to turn to profit, seemed to turn to gold. gold. And people used to come up and they used to touch me and say, I need to touch you because I need to get some of that some of that uh, good look, and I go, it was, it's not good luck, it's just bloody hard work, you know, but uh, people still did it. So that was uh, one of our warehouses for kitty care. We used to buy warehouses um, and uh, use them for kitty care or rent them out, so, um, and that's it. And I used to ask myself each day going home, have I sold or bought the business today? And what I meant is, have I improved the business? So at eight o'clock in the morning when you go in and you come out at eight at night, have you improved your business? Has your business changed? Has it changed even in your mind and physically with stock, with customers? What has changed about your business? Now, have you added new lines on? Have you taken lines off that don't sell or don't make enough money? Have you brought in more staff? You know, whatever it is, have you improved your business? And if you have, then you've sold it. So in other words, it's, it, when you go to sell it, it's more valuable today than it was yesterday. If you haven't done anything, if it's exactly the same for that 12 hours, then you're going backwards. Somebody, and you don't know who it is, some competitor has taken a little bit 
of your business. <coughs> They've either improved theirs by what I've just said um, and, and you're going backwards. And one day, when you see somebody expanding, you can't believe it, is because every day they've been selling their business. And, um, and every day, if you haven't done anything, you're buying your business. And do you, would you buy your business? So you get your business up to it being more valuable to somebody else than it is to you. So conflicts in the business, we had our fair share of conflicts right from the word go. Uh, it wasn't really with suppliers or with customers, it was mostly with the local authority. And the local authority, right from the first shop, we decided on that day when, when um, I was told that I shouldn't sell the shop, the next minute I put loads of stuff outside to attract people and prams and within a few days I was told get the prams off the pavement because that's a public pavement and I had this argument with the council well customers can leave their prams on the pavement all day if they want but because we was in business we couldn't and I used to argue that kind of stuff all the time and, um, and so this time we wanted to rebuild the co-op knock it down, rebuild it, and it was a conservation village, it was really nice, and I wanted to put something really nice, a two-storey, uh, fantastic building on there, and they kept saying, no, 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 they kept rejecting the plans, I'd spent 15,000 in 1989 on, um, on, on for planning permission, and it still come to no. And they wouldn't decide, the last one, because they, they'd run out of excuses, and they wouldn't decide on the, Last one. So I painted it like this, and I put skull and cross, crossbone flags on it as well. That was the, that was halfway through that one. So I painted it, and the customers loved it, um, but the council hated it. And then I rang the council. I said, I "Need my decision? Well, we're not going to give you a decision, you know, for we don't know when." So I said, "I'm going to paint it, paint the car park red, white, and blue, spray it," and they said, "You wouldn't." <laughs> I said, "I'm just asking." Would I be against them? Would it be against the law? And they said you wouldn't spray it. And I said that's not the thing. Is it against the law? And this conversation went on, and eventually they said no, it's not against the law. So I said there'll be a helicopter over there because the six o'clock news will be filming it because <laughs> I'll be spraying it. And they said hold on, hold on. We'll ring you back in fifteen minutes. They rang us back and give us permission and we knock that down and build. We knock the back down and build that two stories high. Then we knock the front down and build that two stories high. And that, that took 35 weeks. And in that 35 weeks, we close at four o'clock one day to put the new electric cables in, but we was open as a shop and it was a building site and we took over a million pounds in sales from there. We did. It's crazy. So, uh, 93, and I always wondered what was wrong with me. I learned that I got dyslexia um, a long time before because I needed people to help me. I needed Marilyn, I needed other people who worked for us to do a lot of what I couldn't do. I could think, but I couldn't put it down on paper. But why, why was it people go, what's wrong with you? You know, because you don't sit still, you are on to the next thing, the next thing. A, a day can consist of six different or ten different ideas and things being implemented and then stop because they don't work, then implement something else. And it was like crazy. It was on a crest of a way and I was run, run, run all the time with all these millions of ideas and then um, I found out why, because I've got ADHD. So that's why I say on the, on the book, you know, those things were, were two great things to great assets. Um, has, does anybody go to a night safe in the bank and deposit money? No, no I'll tell you what a night safe is. A night safe is in every bank, or used to be, and it was a big drawer, so you unlocked it, and you, it's a big metal drawer. And when you pulled, you had to pull the drawer out to make sure it was empty, and you had to push it back to make sure anything was, nothing was stuck. And it went bang, bang. And, you, and that night, we used to go sometimes 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night to deposit the money, 
and you could hear it all echoing down the street, bang, 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 bang. And we was allowed uh, to take, you could only put 5,000 pound cash in those days in a wallet, else it would get stuck if you, if you made the wallet expand. You get stuck in there. So uh, 5,000 pound, one person could take 10,000 pounds. So it was bang, 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 you know, I, and then it was 15,000 pounds, and then it was 20,000 pounds, and then it was two people, then it was three people, then four people. And I, and I was listening to this banging, every week banging away, I kept thinking, listen here, yeah, this is, you can get, you, you can um, get something out of everything. And I was hearing this, and I kept thinking, if we could get another four bangers next week, that's another five grand. So it was an incentive for me to say to everybody, we've got to sell another five grand's worth of prams. We've got to sell another five grand, another five grand. And it got to the point of taking eight people there with 80 grand of cash, and two people get a car, and they'd have pickaxe sandals. You know, and it was like, and the rest of them would be feeding this in. And every, people would, lights would come on, people would be looking out their garden, saying, what's going on? And Marilyn said, we've got to stop this. It's putting the staff at risk who are voluntary going down there because one day we will be robbed. So the next day we had security call come three times a week to collect the money. Um, and she said at the same time as stopping putting your money in the bank, the money you should also go in there from rents. So there's a lot of money going in. And she said also, I want you to stop your rent collecting. Because I was a pretty good rent collector and it didn't uh, interfere with a daytime job. But she said, <coughs> Neville, I don't like it and it's not conducive. You being collecting money, being like that, it's not conducive with a children's shop. So you've got to stop it. So then I had to get a proper firm to do it. So, uh, but that was uh, kind of exciting days where I wasn't afraid of anything. Ah, now, I, be I believe that every single business that's growing needs to play this game called Dad's Dead. So if, this, if you've got uh, a business and it's got quite a few people working in it, um, and there's one person who's in control of it, you play this game. Right, today, Dad's Dead. And the funeral time, is the business open or closed? Well, Dad's dead and he would like the business to carry on, but um, that's up to you. So, half an hour later, um, have we got enough warehouse space to take another five containers? Dad's dead. You'll have to find out. Another five minutes goes by, have we got enough money to pay this bill? Dad's dead. Go and see your bank manager. Who's the bank manager? Dad's dead, I'm not telling you. You know, and it's like every single thing. If you want to run a business, one person can't run a business because they're a bottleneck. And if, the, if, the, if they stop, if they die or are ill, the business stops. You've got to have people who know how to run the business and bring people in. So I recommend at least once a year, play Dad's Dead and see who knows uh, how to run the business. So these are a few things in, 90, in the mid-90s where it was the biggest uh, private landlord uh, for houses and also we was into um, commercial property, the Crownfish Bar and the, the, I don't know what that was, uh, it was a hairdresser, it was a state agent, all those kind of things um, we had. We was getting pretty good at buying and um, creating commercial stuff. But it was all kind of low end. It was, yeah. So when you brush your balls, you know, and um, uh, and and you are getting somewhere, you have to have a few toys to keep you going. Um, but some of the stuff was mad. I won't bore you with that. Marilyn did ask me why I wanted two red Bentleys. I said because one's a turbo and it's nice. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, why? Makes sense to me. Why? Why? <laughs> I don't know. So, CTT, creative thinking time. 
the more time we had, the more holidays we had, the more the business grew. Because every time we went on holiday, creative thinking time. Now on this particular holiday in 1997, that was in Tenerife, where we took the whole family for a couple of weeks to a, a nice place. And once you've woke up in the morning and had breakfast and you've said to each other, it's going to be a nice day, isn't it? Yeah, it's going to be a nice day. Ooh, what are the, the temperatures going to be? What do you say? You brainstorm. The brain kicks in and you're in business and you're brainstorming all the time. And um, how to make it better, how to make it more money, how to make whatever, you know, to make it improve your life. And I said, you know this thing called the internet? That they sell books uh, on the internet. Well, I reckon in five years' time, our customers will be off be buying online. No, never, never. Anyway, so, and I said to my son-in-law, you know, you've got a computer, you know about computers, make us a internet website. So that was the seed that was planted, it was. So um, three years later, he hadn't got much time, but he was, he was good at organising build slots and things like that and getting people. But we've got somebody, Gadget his name was, Barry Gadget, and he still works with me, 20 odd, he started in 1998. I was unloading lorries, 40 foot lorries, all day. Everybody else was, we'd, we'd got about 35, 40 staff at the time, and they used to put it away, and, and, and I needed somebody to break down cardboard, the outer boxes, and put it in a skip. And, um, and we advertised, this, this lad came, and uh, he, uh, he, was in, he went in the office, I was outside in the loading lorry, he went into an op the office and within two minutes he was out. And I went to the office, he passed me when he got in his car, and I opened the door, I never even put my foot in the door, because I was too, I was too busy. And I said to Marilyn and the, the secretary, when does he start? And they go, he's not. I go, why? He didn't ask any questions. And I said, I don't want him to ask fucking questions, I wanted to break cardboard boxes down give him a call and get him in. So he got the job the next day, and he was shy. Um, he'd been bullied in his previous job, and I said, we haven't got time for that, and if you, if you ever do, you speak to me, I'll sort it out. Anyway, he, um, three weeks after flattening the cardboard and taking the rubbish out from the girls' desk at four o'clock in the afternoon, I was in there with somebody one day, and one of the girls said, oh, my computer's gone wrong. And Barry looked over his shoulder and just did something, whatever he did to the computer. And they go, how yeah, did you know how to do that? I said, he said, it's my hobby. And this is how we found loads of people in kiddie care. This is how we grew uh, kiddie care, because it was like people would do what they liked when we found out what they liked. And, and I said, put the baskets down, Barry. You, you, you're now our uh, IT manager. So you never know what you're getting when you employ somebody. And do you know what he said? He basically he says in his quiet and assuming voice, well I'll just come put these in, in the skip and then I'll come back. Yeah. And two weeks later I was sitting on his desk saying, Barry, yeah, my dream is to get this internet going. You know, I've asked I've asked my son in law and he hasn't got time. Um, do you know anything about it? And he goes, Oh yeah, yeah. I built my own site. Now what? <laughs> <laughs> my own site. So what with him and my son-in-law and, and Marilyn and myself and the girls, we fed what what was the experience of the shop into a build platform and, and uh, uh, Scott, my son-in-law, put it into uh, you know a works program and Barry did it. And then we opened up, that was Christmas Day 1999 and we sold the McLaren pushchair. So, it was great. Now, when you look at a business, I, you can either look at the books, but it's pretty boring looking at books, because you only look at the end figure. But I like looking at it in different ways. I like, like looking at it in warehouses and square footage and things like this. When we started, I had the van. 
I have a little Suzuki van. When we had three shops, I used to go around every night with a van full delivering um, stock to the shops and then go back to the main shop and get some more. Anyway, it, it, it then progressed to a bigger van and then it progressed to Luton and then it progressed to 40 footers. And in the end, from 1977 to 2010, we were shipping, I think it's 17 40 footers. Yeah, something like that, 17 40 footers a day. And they, were, and they built double decker, uh, double deckers for us. As the first, we were the first people to have double deckers because there were 700 big parcels on each of those wagons. And of course, there was the same amount going in each day. So uh, that's, that's what I like to see, not just the figures. So marble properties were still going. You know, we were still buying and selling, and, um, and we've got contractors building and different things. And that was a typical building, um, and it's three million pounds. Well, I haven't got three million pounds, so I've got 250,000 pounds. And we always leveraged it. So I went to the bank and said, could I have two and, a, two and three quarters of a million? And they said, no, not for that, you can't. But you could have two. So I had to find three quarters of a million somewhere. So I went back to our house, like uh, that we had mortgaged and uh, remortgaged and, and then paid off and remortgaged again. And I got £750,000 remortgage on that. Went back to the bank, said, I've got a million now. Um, bought it for three million pounds. I put hot point in, you know, the people who do the fridges and freezers, and they wouldn't take a long-term lease. So they leased it on a monthly basis for 18 months, which the rent paid the rent, um, interest on 250,000, interest on 750, and interest on the two million. And, it, and we got a 200,000 pound profit as well in 18 months. But luckily, or unluckily, somebody near there had a fire, Marks and Spencers. They needed a, a, a building within a month. And the agent said, um, do you want to sell it for four and a half million? So because it didn't have a proper tenant in there, we could give them a month's notice and we made 1.7 million in 18 months on that. A couple of years later, we bought it back for less than we'd sold it. We let it for 10 years, made four and a half million in um, rent, and then sold it for 5.5 million to the next door neighbor. So uh, that's the kind of thing. There's opportunities that some you've got to uh, build, um, build your business around those opportunities. This was built in 2002. This was going to be the shop to end all shops that we're doing. This is the last shop we're ever going to do. I have 60,000 square foot. Marilyn had her office up there. And when they come to fit the desk and things, they said to me, where are you having your office? Where are you having your desk? And I said, I'm not having one. Marilyn can have one because she needs one. She's in control. I don't need a desk. What I need is a fork truck, I need a lorry, I need whatever. I'm on the floor with the customers, I'm on the floor, I'm on the uh, picking and packing, I'm, yeah, things like that. So um, I didn't have an office up there, and Marilyn did, and that was nice. And um, that was really, really good. That was going to be it. No more shops, but we were building, we kept the building business. That uh, had 65 people in there. And we were thinking about sailing away somewhere, having gin and tonics at six o'clock, or five or four, whatever. Anyway, so the next year, we built another 20,000 square foot at the back of the car park for storage. The following year, we built another 20,000 square foot on there. Then we put mezzanine floors in, because we didn't have racking in those days, so it was easier to take pallets in on the floor. So uh, now we've got 105,000 square foot. Um, and what happens? Well, they're lovely staff, 65 of them, um, and you learn a lot from, uh, from staff, and it shapes your business. So, 
2005, everything was booming. Uh, Royal Bank of Scotland came along and, and looked at the two businesses and said, we'll give you 36 million, <coughs> do with what you like at 0 0.8. Oh, uh, oh, less. There's less than one percent. Yeah, eighty over base. Well, it was, it was less than one percent. Yeah, so wasn't it? So it was good, wasn't it? You know, it, unbelievable. And now we was getting six percent on deposit on another bank, but I wasn't bright enough to take the thirty-six million and stick it in another bank. <laughs> 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 anyway. Yeah, so, so therefore, I said no. We we did get a few million. I think six and a half, and then another couple. Um, and uh, but that's how crazy the days were. If you'd got a pulse, you could get money. Even if the pulse stopped working while they was lending it to you, they'd still lend it to you. Or even if you got a hole in your ass, you'd get the money. That's what I meant to say. So it's like they were giving it away, but everything was too expensive. So we used to keep everything simple. Use the KISS method, because if you do that, keep it simple, and if you don't, you're stupid. So that's what I used to say. You know, if we did things wrong, we were stupid, because we didn't keep it simple enough. And if your business is simple, it usually works. So one day, my, our, well, our two daughters, my two daughters, our two daughters saw a plant on a desk and they said, what's this for, Dad? And I said, I'm building a warehouse, dark warehouse for the HMRC records and a, uh, a, a warehouse for nephew and son, which I think is a pharmaceutical. Uh, because I've just bought some land across the other side of Peterborough. <coughs> and they both said, build us the biggest shop in the world. And I thought about it for about two seconds and I said, yes, I will. So, <laughs> so everything was out the window again and we started building this monster of a building. It was unbelievable. It was three floors high at the front. Uh, going to where that grey meets a lighter grey, it was four floors high, picking and packing, and then the rest was 12 metres high, double deep racket. And it was unbelievable. And we've got about something like 14 and a half million into the build, and then what happens? 2007 8 comes along, and there's the biggest crash in history. So we've gone from that terrace now to that, you know, over there. So this, um, this is Marilyn's uh, seed that she sowed, really, when she was in this little shop selling second-hand prams. Everybody knew there was about 1,250 other pram shops in the country, and we knew nothing, and some of them have been in business for 30 years. So it was a good job that we didn't know anything because you make your own rules and we've gone from that in 30 years to the biggest, the biggest nursery shop in the world, I think. We're definitely in England and all the reps said it was in Europe. So um, and we had a, eventually about 125 staff in there. But um, that's how it was. And then they shit it to the fan and uh, we was living the dream. The biggest recession came and we went to hell because we owed somehow 14 and a half million. And that was going to be paid off through profit over the next three years. That's how good the business was. Um, people was buying 1,700 pound prams one day and we were selling loads of them. And the next day, it was like it was in a train crash, 100 miles an hour crash because the next day it was £299 prams. Now we had, we'd only got about three weeks of £299 prams. We've got 23 weeks in the pipeline of 15, 1600 pound prams, you know, it's like, and you couldn't stop it. It's like a tanker. So we run out of the 
and we run out of all the cheap stuff and then we had to keep reducing the dear stuff basically to cost or uh, to keep selling, keep the people employed. We should have made 20 redundant, but we didn't because we knew each of them, we knew all the families and we knew it'd be hard for them. So we didn't. So we started to lose £250,000 a month on that business where we should be making £250,000 a month. So things were really a living hell. Um, we sold the mansion, what we've got, and um, that we've been living in for 26 years, and I reduced it um, from what the value was, I reduced it down £500,000 to sell it. And all the agents said, you're mad, because you can get a lot more. I go, no, the, the, the market is dropping like a stone and I need the money and I've got to get in front of the curve and not be on the downward spiral with everybody else. So we sold it in a week and we walked out of the house with our suitcases and we left the 26 years of really <coughs> good stuff in there and it was like a hotel. It was magnificent. It didn't have a thing to do. Even the even the beds were made with clean sheets, weren't there? And, um, and all the pictures on the wall, everything. Oh, it was just incredible. There was a lot of money's worth in there, but we couldn't do anything about it because mentally we couldn't move it, physically we couldn't because we was fighting fires all the time. And mentally we were shattered. We were um, trying to get keep the business going. And so we then had to, uh, we could have run away we could, because we've got three million pounds in our um, pension. Now we could have ran away and lived a life of luxury, or maybe luxury, um, but there's 125 staff. Now they've been loyal to us, a lot of them have been loyal to us 16 to 20 years. And um, so they came first. He was like, do you run away with three, three million or do you stop here? Now we knew that if we went bust, we could start back in a caravan and I could go window cleaning. I've got no fear of that whatsoever. But 125 people who come to work to pay the mortgage, to have their car, to look after their family and have their holidays, that wasn't on their agenda to go into a caravan and window clean or whatever. So we needed to do something pretty radical quick. So we redesigned hundreds and hundreds of products and uh, the major products was our high, high chairs, cots, <coughs> prams. We redesigned some and in, within three months we've got them manufactured. So we brought a, a, a cot bed down from £199 to £69 and we had the help of the manufacturers, we had the help of the component manufacturers and everybody along the line they took a cut because they knew that we was their best customer and they took a cut because they knew the trouble we was in. So everybody helped in there. But, um, so after remodeling the business, we went back the following month into profit and then um, it, was, uh, it, it was over. And, but we had been to hell and back and uh, there was a lot more to it that if you read the book, you will cry. Yeah, so it's uh, an unfair world sometimes, um, but there you are. Anyway, we got out of it, and um, and somebody rang me, they was trying to buy the shop, I've been trying to buy our business for five years before we went into the big business, uh, the big one, and they kept saying, we want to buy it, we want to buy it. I've got, there was an agent saying, I want to buy it. Well, loads of agents say these things, and I was, really feeling ill one day when this agent and rang me every three months saying, what about your business? And uh, I was really, no, I listened to his crap. And uh, and then he said, you know, oh, how's your family? You know, you going on holiday? What are you going to do for Christmas? And, um, and then he said, don't forget, I'll buy your business if you want to sell it. And I said, I do. And it was just like that. It wasn't, what we didn't contemplate selling it like that. I said, I do. The silence over the phone, he said, <laughs> I've been phoning you for five years and I thought, put your, um, put your money where your fucking mouth is because I'd, I'd heard it all before and I didn't believe he could sell it. Next day he come in and we signed all the paperwork 
We did our own due diligence, which cost £30,000. So we put 150 sheets of information up into the cloud um, and then he advertised it. And within three weeks, we got 30 bits. Most of them was from the high street because they was all doing what, what every, everybody was doing the same. They was in recession, they was trying to bolt something onto their business to save it or to bolster their um, revenue. <coughs> so 30 businesses. Um, and then we was in negotiation and then there was drop in because the price was going up. The price was going up and up and up and there was less and less. And we, had, we let about seven people into the uh, um, room in the sky, you know, where you can look at, the, look at all the information. And, um, and then a couple of weeks later, we had uh, seven bids of 70 million and uh, we just made a choice. And then, and then on the 14th of February, um, 2011, we, uh, we got 70 million in the bank, which wasn't too bad, because it's a world record for a mum and dad uh, nursery shop, and I think that will never, ever be beaten, ever. So, uh, so but on the 3rd of February, that same year, we, uh, we opened a, um, another business, and, um, and this was a building business, Heidi Estates. Heidi is one of our grandchildren, and, um, and we built 600 houses from 2011 to um, 2017, I think, or 18, and then we sold the business. Some of those houses are where, are down Port Road, where, opposite where Rob lives. Yeah. yeah, lovely houses. So that was one business that we had, and we went into many more businesses. We built that in 2012. It houses 350 people. It was, a, it was the first Brian accident building in Peterborough, and we've still got it. Although, for the last three years, nobody's been in there. 350 people work from home, and they've just renewed the lease. So, <laughs> it's, it's a worldwide company. Um, Alga Marina, we bought that 2013, and we've got a mission for loads of houses and more boats and retail, and we might start that. We were the first people in Peterborough to start converting offices into residential when the uh, government changed the rules. And we've got a business that renovates um, old barns. So we found this, or my, <coughs> one of my son-in-laws found this, in the middle of Stamford, looking over the meadows and the river. And you couldn't see, it was, it was devastated with the weeds and stuff, ivy growing up there. So we said to the people, it wasn't for sale by the way, we knew the people, my son-in-law went and said, what are you gonna do with it? And they said, we're gonna turn it into three apartments. And he said, how much will you sell those apartments for? And they told him, and he said, well, don't, don't do that, I'll give you that money. I'll give you what you've just said you'll get after you've done all the renovations. And they couldn't believe it. And they go, no, well, what it is, is my daughter is a runner, an iron man, and she thought it'd be nice to run from home four or five miles into work every day and run back with the kids in the push chairs, you know. And, and, uh, and then they come back and they said, well, we think by the time we've done them, the price will go up 50 grand. So we said, we'll give you the 50 grand. And then he got into the solicitor's hands and they said, we think, we've been thinking about it, you're gonna make some money on this, you know. He said, well, another 50 grand. So we said, tell you what, you either sign today or forget it. So they signed because they were making a hundred grand more than they would have done on making three apartments, right? So we only wanted the top two floors. We didn't realize this until we put floors in because it was all rotten. There was 200 pigeons in there. So we let the bottom to an estate agent. The garages, which were that building there, we turned them into a two bedroom house. And then the garden was overgrown. When we was clearing the garden, we found another house. <laughs> so, so we get about 40 grand of rent off that. And we've, oh, and you've got eight parking spaces, which are in Stamford are worth 60 grand each. 
So we didn't do bad on that, and that's where we have our office at the moment. Um, and, and we do renovate, um, we do renovate old buildings, and we've got quite a few on the go at the moment. So 2016, I thought I'd share the secrets of success. So I wrote this book, and it, and it, and it took me four years, because it's 140,000 words, and that's a lot. You know, I had to do it in four years, but I wrote a million, being dyslexic, to get 140,000 words was spelled correctly. Yeah, so it was a, a labour of love really because I, I did it in the four years between half past 10 at night and 20 past three in the morning. So um, in places it should make you laugh uh, and I uh, damn well know it'll make you cry in other places. Um, so uh, and I, I, read, I read it, I wrote it, we didn't really write it, I wrote it to motivate and inspire and help entrepreneurs exceed in their business. And there's a bit at the bottom that I'm not going to say because I start crying if I read that out. So, and we don't want that, we don't. So there we are, we're, in 2017, we go on to build flats. We've still got those. I told somebody today we'd sold all the houses, didn't they? But oh, we haven't, we haven't. We, I'll just remember, we're, not, we're, still, yeah, we're, we're, we're still building. Yeah, we're building those. Um, not we're building, we're building years ago, 2017. So we were the first people, like in 2019, the first people in Peterborough that's um, built offices. And there was an opportunity because nobody had built offices from about 2005. Because then there was a problem, then they turned the offices into uh, accommodation, but now there was an opportunity and we put um, the insurance company soft and soft into a 10,000 unit. We've got some, uh, somebody, where did they come from? Switzerland, they come from um, Handel's Banking, and at the same time, we did Starbucks. <coughs> so, Starbucks was sent us the plans of their new design. So we copied the design onto the uh, offices that was going to build. So Starbucks had got one of these like glass turrets going up. This was their new design. So we got it all passed. And then at the last minute, they come back to us and they said, forget about the new design, we're not doing those. Um, carry on with the old design. So we've got the old design Starbucks that we built and we went. And the new design, really nice offices. And, um, but they were based on the new Starbucks um, plans. So we've still got those. So there is um, some things are too good. And when you've got a recession and you can, and not many people borrow money because they can't borrow. When you've got a good business and lots of assets, um, we've got, uh, 20 million pounds worth of assets in the in the building business by 2008. Then there was 30 million pounds worth of assets and they'd gone down to 20 million. Now this building was brand new. They're trying to rent it at eight pounds square foot and they got into trouble and it's 11 million they was asking for. It, it was either eight pounds square foot or 11 million pound, whichever came first. So I bid seven million, and they said, fuck off, <laughs> uh, uh, because they got a bid was higher. They've got several bids, but they kept going down. And they said, we got one of seven and a half, so unless you bid higher than that, I said, it's not worth it. Well, fuck off. You know, anyway, so I did. And, and that was about uh, two months later, they came back and they said, Neville, uh, we fell out with that person at seven and a half million, will you give us your seven? And I said, let me think about it. <laughs> so I said, no, because their prices were going down and down and down. So they said, well, what would they, what, what will you give me? And, and I said, it'd be too embarrassing, you'll only tell me to fuck off. And well, we won't, we won't, we won't, we promise we won't, we won't. And I said, no, it's too embarrassing because it'd be embarrassing for me for a rejection because you'll reject it. And he, and he rang me every single day, every day. And I said, okay, four and a half million. And he said, 
no five, I said no four. Because this is what's going to happen. You'll get four next week, you get four and a half now, or four next week, three and a half the week after. And he says, okay, we'll take it. We'll take it as long, uh, but you'll have to give us five million if you take one of the people we've been negotiating with for renting it. Then they've got 50 names at eight pound a square foot. And then, so we put it at two pound 85 a square foot. And, um, and we got somebody else. So we still paid four and a half uh, million and was getting a seven and a half percent return from word go, from the minute go. So we kept that for, I think it was about nine years. Um, we got the four and a half million back in rent and then we sold it for 9.75 million. So these things can, can be done in, in the middle of a recession. So this is what we're doing at the moment. We're buying sites, old sites. This this site, what this is on is uh, twelve and a half acres. We're going to put about two hundred, or we've started putting about two hundred thousand square foot on. This is an old farm. We're renovating nine buildings um, back to the original. Well, they don't, they don't look really nice. They will, and that's the kind of thing we do at the moment, and um, amongst a lot of other stuff. Uh, yeah, so there we are. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, you've been very patient and very good for any heckling. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. <laughs>